Hi there, I'm a second year physicist and I found revising to be quite tiring, so I'm going to be making a few videos explaining some of the physics concepts I've learned this semester. Over the past year and a half, I've learned a lot of maths which is quite important for understanding the physics I'm learning. I don't have the time now to teach all the maths which I'll be using in full, but I'll try to explain what these equations and operators and things do. Okay, now let's start with a nice, easy topic, the Schrodinger wave equation. Right, it's not so easy, but it's what I've learned and it's a fascinating bit of physics. The Schrodinger equation is all about energy, finding the different energies a particle can have. Yup, that's energies. We're looking at things which have more than one answer. If you did a bit of quantum physics at school, you might remember that atoms, and indeed all particles, have energy levels. The Schrodinger wave equation lets us calculate what these energies are. Let's start with thinking about kinetic energy. We define kinetic energy as T, which is equal to half mv squared. It turns out that talking about velocity isn't very useful, so let's change this equation to depend on momentum. You probably know that we can think of particles as waves, at least at the tiny scales where we need to use quantum mechanics. To help us move between these two ways of thinking about matter, we can use the Broglie's equation. Lambda equals Planck's constant, h, divided by momentum. We don't see matter acting as waves in everyday life, because Planck's constant is absolutely tiny. It's 6.62 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So the wavelength of a human walking would be about a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a hundredth of a millimetre. However, de Broglie's equation is useful for minute particles like protons and electrons. So let's rearrange for momentum so we can put it into our kinetic energy equation. It's going to be useful to talk about h-bar and the wave number instead of h and the wavelength. h-bar is the reduced Planck's constant, h divided by 2 pi. Physicists use this to avoid having all sorts of 2 pi's wandering around in equations. The wave number is 2 pi divided by the wavelength, and we use it to encode the same information. It just turns out to be easier to work with, as we'll see. We also know that k is going to change depending on the energy. Remember seeing an electromagnetic spectrum at school? You've got visible light around the middle, high energy, low wavelength gamma and x-rays at this end, and low energy, high wavelength radio and microwaves at this end. Since k depends only on lambda, it's going to depend only on the same things lambda does, in this case, energy. Okay, this is our new kinetic energy equation. Notice that in any given problem, these bits are constant, however this bit changes. We'll come back to this in a minute. For now, let's look at waves. We use wave functions to encode information about waves. These are just equations which have a few special properties. Generally, we call our wave functions psi, and they look like this. This may look a bit scary, but bear with me. This e to the i thing is actually just a different way to write sines and cosines. And waves are just combinations of sines and cosines. The reason we write the wave equation as this is because of this nice property of e which means that if you differentiate it, you get the same thing multiplied by the differential of the argument, this bit, like so. So if we differentiate an exponential, we get the exponential back and we generate this other term. We can do this again and get another factor out. Now we've pulled the k squared term out of this exponential, so you might see where we're going with this. I'm just gonna make a few points about what we just did. This type of problem is called an eigenvalue problem. We say that this is an eigenfunction of this operator. An operator is just something that you can use on a function to make another function. So this would be a doubling operator applied to the function y. Eigenfunctions of operators are functions which return themselves and an eigenvalue after the operator is used on them, like this. The bit extra is the eigenvalue. Knowing what we do now about eigenfunctions and operators, Let's make a kinetic energy operator. We want the energy, E. We're going to assume that there's no potential energy, only kinetic energy. We know there's a bunch of answers, so we're going to use our wave function to generate those answers. We also know a way to generate a k squared. We appear to have a problem here. The d is no longer straight. This is actually a partial derivative instead of a total derivative. This just means that there's more than one variable in the function, but we treat it as a constant when we're differentiating. We also need to account for the minus sign. And that's it. Well, sort of. Here we have the time-independent, one-dimensional Schrodinger equation for a particle which is not in a potential, or 1D TISE in free space, for short. Let's try 
and make this equation more general. Fortunately, we've done the hardest bit. Let's deal with the time component first. We know the energy of a photon of light is related to its frequency by h, and we can do our 2 pi thing to get energy in terms of h bar and omega, the angular frequency. We're going to assume that we can use the same formula for particles, which turns out to be a good assumption. Note that this energy isn't added to the kinetic energy, but is another way of finding the total energy. We know there's going to be a set of energies, so we want another eigenvalue equation, this time to find E by generating an omega. If we have another look at the wave function, we can see an easy way to generate an omega, use a derivative with respect to time to pull it out. This time, we only need the first order derivative, but we do need to account for this minus i term, so let's add an i to this operator. And that's equal to the equation we had before. There's still a problem with this equation though, it's only in one spatial dimension, whereas we may need to consider all three. This is surprisingly straightforward to do. The three dimensions, in Cartesian coordinates at least, are orthogonal, that means they don't interfere with each other. For this problem, we can think of the different kinetic energies, each contributing to the total energy separately. In 3D, the wave equation becomes this, so the time dependent Schrodinger equation becomes this. We can simplify by adding the Laplacian, which is an operator which adds the three different second differentials. Finally, we need to add any terms due to any potentials the particle might be in. We call a potential V, and V can depend on any combination of X, Y, Z, and T. But this potential varies from problem to problem, so we just add the general form into the equation. This new operator is called the Hamiltonian, h hat, and is equal to t plus v. If there's no potential term, v equals zero, and we recover the free space result. Now we can write the full Schrodinger wave equation.